I want to give you an example of, of what we uh, have used in the, the North Munich Church when we were planting that church as just sort of an uh, aid for us to sort of plan and make sure that we were very intentional about leading people through all these various growth phases from indifference all the way through to being a faithful follower of Christ. Uh, because we wanted our church to be a disciple-making church. Uh, Jesus gave us the command to make disciples. The command is not just to gather people for a meeting once a week. Uh, the command is not just to build a building and put a cross on top of it. The command is to make disciples. And so we can be doing all these other good things, but if we're not helping people to become faithful followers of Jesus Christ, then we're failing at one of the most essential commands that the Lord gave us. And so we wanted to structure our church in a way that was very intentional about disciple making. And so we sort of took the Great Commission and we broke it down the way the Great Commission is in Matthew. Uh, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So the, the ultimate command, in fact, in the Greek, the main command is make disciples. And that is broken down and described in terms of participles grammatically. The main imperative is make disciples. And we're told to go, go and make disciples, or literally going as you go, make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And so all of these should contribute to the making of disciples. And we tried to break that down uh, a little bit more methodically and what that really means. And in going, what that meant was sort of building relationships. We've talked about that, getting in touch with people, loving people. And those people may be people who are indifferent to the gospel. They're indifferent to Christianity or to Jesus Christ. Uh, those are the people we're trying to touch. And so we build relationships with them. And as I mentioned, you might join a club, you might get involved in a community event, meeting your neighbors, inviting people over, whatever that takes. Key idea is really showing the love of Christ, that Christ cares about people. And so the value that's involved in that is the value of relevance, of relationship, of meeting people's needs, of building trust, seeking the lost. Jesus came, said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. We seek out people, we build credibility, or to use the words of Paul, we become a Greek to the Greeks. Paul was willing to adapt his own lifestyle, though he'd grown up as a Jew, a Jew of the Jews, and a Pharisee, and had those strict convictions. He was willing to sacrifice some of those personal preferences to become a Greek to the Greek, to reach the Greeks. And so this is what we're talking about here. And then sort of the next phase would be then communicating the gospel, as we've said. So we build a relationship. We, we find people that then have shown some interest. Jesus said, don't cast pearls before swine. If people are just utterly against the message, we, we don't need to try and force it on them. But as people become interested, then we communicate the gospel. And this is, this is the more direct evangelism, loving people and then evangelizing, communicating the gospel. And so the value involved here is biblical proclamation. What did Paul say in Romans? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of salvation to all who believe. And so it's that gospel where, where Christ evidences his power to save people. So we want to communicate that. And so we not only seek the lost, we seek to save the lost, to lead them back to a relationship with Christ. And every Christian should be a witness in one way or another in sharing that message. Well, now we come to the point of baptism, which would really be the point of conversion, of leading people not only to hear and understand the message, but to exercise repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and become his follower. And so these would be seekers who have now heard the message they're seeking, they're open, and we help them to make that step of commitment. That is also a part of evangelism. And here the value is that necessity of personal decision. It's not good enough to just sort of vaguely have an interest in Christianity or Jesus. We help people to make that commitment. 
it's sort of like a marriage, you know. You may have a dating or a courting period where you get to know the partner, but there comes that day where you stand before the marriage altar or in city hall or wherever you do it, and you make that commitment public. And so baptism becomes that public confession of faith, that public commitment to Jesus Christ. But as we said, we need to follow up. And so we move from there to following up in faith and obedience that a person not just receives the forgiveness of Christ, but increasingly places their life under the Lordship of Christ. And we submit our will to his. We allow his spirit to begin to change our lives. He brings things to attention. These are people who are now new believers that need to be helped to grow in their walk. And the value here is then the discipleship piece much more. Love, evangelism, and now disciple making. And the value here is becoming a follower of Christ. Practical faith and obedience. Truth, communicating God's truth that they understand God's word. Personal renewal, Christian disciplines. What does it mean to pray, to read the Bible, to share your faith, to be in fellowship and so on. And then to enfold them into the church. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded means being a part of the body of Christ. And so now disciples become a part of the fellowship of the church. And so commitment to one another, faithfulness, unity, being a part of that spiritual family is a part of being a child of God. And then training people to serve. And here we're talking about people who have become members of the church or they're at least committed to the church and becoming servants. And so we help people discover their spiritual gifts. We teach them that they are responsible to serve others, not just to be served. Stewardship of their time, of their talent, of their resources. And then what never ends really is promoting further spiritual growth. And here we're talking about helping even servants to become deeper in their walk with God and growing in edification, building up their faith. Here we're talking about sanctification, increasingly honoring God in Christ's likeness. Now this appears to be sort of a very linear process the way we've set it up here. Of course, it's not always such a linear process in making disciples, but it did help us as a church to ask ourselves the question, are we bringing people along this process of spiritual maturity? And what are we doing? You'll notice I very intentionally left this last column over here. I left it blank on this chart. Because you may want to take this diagram, you want to, may want to take this table, and with your church or in your planning process, even in a new church plant, say what are the activities or ministries or programs that we are going to do to achieve that goal? See, what we did in the Munich church may be very different than what you do in your particular place of ministry. And so just for example here, as I mentioned, we encourage people to get involved in community activities, build those relationships, get out of your little Christian uh, pocket and get out and get to know non-Christians. Become involved in service, get involved and find ways that you can demonstrate love in the community. And then here in this particular area of evangelism, we had personal evangelism training. That's something we could do. We had evangelist events. I mentioned uh, in one church we had tent evangelization. In Munich we didn't do that. But we had lectures. We had uh, various other approaches. In this box here we said, well, what are we going to do when people become new Christians? Well, we had uh, follow-up basic Bible courses for new believer courses. So whenever we had an evangelistic event, we would always have sort of a course for new believers. And that course, by the way, was practical. One of the things I've observed is that sometimes we will have a follow-up Bible course for new believers, but it's very theological. It's very um, abstract. But what does the new Christian need? The brand new baby Christian needs to know, how do I read the Bible? What is the Bible? How do I pray? What does it mean to pray? How do I deal with temptations in my life? 
they need those practical steps on just learning how to be a Christian, like a little baby just first needs to learn how to walk. But sometimes these follow-up courses get into all kinds of theological issues that a new Christian really can't relate to yet. Now that will be important for them to grow later on, but I'm convinced that in the early stages of discipleship, they need more practical kind of help in Christian disciplines. And then down here, uh, we had our small groups, our cell group system to integrate people into the family of God. So, so yes, we have a larger worship service, but get involved in that small group where you're in a committed relationship with other Christians. Uh, you might have new members classes, uh, help people discover their spiritual gifts. Again, we found the small groups were the key place to help people discover spiritual gifts. And we wanted those small groups also to be a place where people are constantly growing in their walk with Christ. So anyway, this is a, an approach that you can use if you find this helpful, use it. If you don't, do something else. <laughs> but the main thing is make sure that your church plant is being very intentional about leading people to Christ and helping them to faithfully become disciples of Christ. It doesn't happen automatically. And just having them attend church on Sunday and going home again is normally not going to be enough. And you can't assume that. So that is the importance of being a disciple-making church. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So here's a few questions for application if you're discussing these topics with your group or in your class, here's some things you may want to discuss. What methods of evangelism have proven effective in your place of ministry? We've given you a long list of different kinds of evangelistic activities, personal evangelism, event evangelism, film, and so on and so forth. What has God blessed where you work? What follow-up methods are being used to disciple new believers? I hope that in your church plan or in your church, you're seeing new people come to faith in Jesus Christ. What are you intentionally doing to help them in those first steps of just finding out what it means to be a Christian and to live with Jesus? And how can you strengthen the integration of new believers into the life of the church? Sometimes people make some kind of a commitment to follow Christ, but for various reasons they don't want to associate with a church. They may have the old critique, well, everybody in the church is a hypocrite, or the church is just a human institution, or they may fear what their family will think if they associate with other Christians. Will their family persecute them? Uh, will this have negative repercussions for their jobs or their income? And so helping people make that transition to identifying with a Christian community is going to be very critical. In some parts of the world, that's a difficult, difficult phase. They say, Jesus, yes, but church, no. And you're going to have to be intentional about finding ways to help people make that transition. So these are some questions you can discuss. <laughs> 